Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black, everything, everything Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by a special guest, Robin Bissell, who is the director of the new film, Best of Enemies, based on the story of C.P. Ellis and Ann Atwater, uh, Dormites uh, who are on different sides of the political tracks, if you will, um, who come together and were the subject of a best-selling book by Osha Gray Davidson called Best of Enemies. How are you doing, Robin? I'm great. I'm great. Nice to be here, Mark. I, I have to ask you, I, I, you mentioned earlier you grew up in Philadelphia. Yes. Um, what brought you to this story, The Best of Enemies? You know, I used to get Time Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a milestones page. I don't know if you remember that. It listed kind of anybody who had passed away or births or other notable things. It was kind of like the People magazine yeah. page yeah. of time. And it was 2005, and there was that blurb about C.P. Ellis' death. Yeah. And it said two sentences. It said, or one maybe, Klan leader turned union activist. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, at first you go, okay. And then I just wanted to find out how that happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I started digging, and very shortly after that, I found out why it happened, and that's Ann Atwater yeah. um, and Bill Riddick. And so I read the book. I found that there was a book. And then I saw a short documentary made by Diane Bloom in mm -hmm. 2003, I guess. And uh, hearing them talk about each other, that's what really, that succession of things really just grabbed me. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I have to make this You movie. see kind of admiration between, yeah. between the two of them? Yeah. Uh, you know, you had worked on, you know, on the production, so, you know, executive producer of The Hunger Games, mm -hmm. um, uh, Free State of Jones. Mm -hmm. um, what made you decide to go behind the camera, you know, for this? Yeah, so I, had st I moved to L.A. as a singer-songwriter, and so I was like, you know, and that didn't work out. Um, what kind of music? It was uh, funk, like, uh, oh, wow. it started out as folk, but then I started a band, it was a funk rock band, and we had a record deal, and... <laughs> Um, kind of like the Black Crows. Yeah, right? a little bit, yeah. <laughs> but we loved the meters and all, you know, we thought we were so great. Um, but tried that for about four years. Okay. And then, and then so then I went into, and I kind of fell into producing. I got this job by, with a writer-director named Gary Ross, and I started as his assistant, kind of mm -hmm. send it as producers as, as happens. Yeah. Um, but always wanted to, I just felt really suited to directing um, because... Um, especially ha having been a producer, you gain a lot of confidence just right. being around the set and knowing the process. It was, the, the thing was I didn't know, I knew in order to be able to direct, I'd have to write something that was good enough where I said, no one else is going to direct this but me. Right. And so uh, that was what I was really scared of, was writing. Uh, but it came out great. So I was yeah, I Talk was about happy. the adaptation process. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, thankfully with a true story like this, and one so important, I not only had the book and I had the documentary just to get tone and feel, but I had, I got to know Ann Atwater for three years. Yeah. You know, I first met her in 2013 and, and she was, uh, you know, I had only, uh, what I would read and all that was the rough house Annie part, right? <laughs> that I'm going to get things done and she's a vehicle for change and she's a catalyst and, and, and of course helped just countless people. Then when I met her, um, she was all those things, but she had this huge heart, massive compassion. And, um, and, and then I heard, heard people starting to refer to her as Grandma Ann. And it just, it was amazing. So, so to have her and sh her keeping me on the narrow, straight and yeah. narrow when I was writing, and Bill Riddick still alive, and telling me about, you know, keeping me um, kind of focused. Yeah. To have all those things put together really helped me in the writing. How process. much contact did you have with Davidson in the process? You know, uh, I talked to, uh, to OSHA early on in 2009. I got the rights as a producer. And then I kind of let them lapse because I didn't know what to do with the project. Um, um, because, you know, as a producer, you have to find a writer, find a director. Yeah. And the director I was working with was already working on Free State of Jones uh, or researching that. So he, I, he wasn't going to do both. So... Um, then I went and produced The Hunger Games, and right after that, I said, okay, I'm going to go back. And that's when I called Osha, and he was gracious enough to give me the right. So he's been a great, great help as well. There's a, you know, there's a, I think when you think about a story like this, um, so much of the film part of it is the timing of when you get it done. Yeah. Um, if this is done 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier, it probably feels more like driving this daisy <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe. than it does now. How are you able to find the balance? And what do you think has kind of changed, you know, culturally and also in Hollywood that you could tell this story the way it needs to be told? Uh, that's a really great question, uh, especially the, the last part of that question, because 
Um, you know, uh, timing is everything just to get a movie made. It's yeah. so impossible. So for me, this was a, you know, from 2013 to I shot it in 2017, that's pretty relatively s small window right. for an independent film. But our timing worked out with Taraji. Once Taraji said yes, yeah. the momentum started, you know. Um, as far as relevancy goes, you know, I felt it was relevant in yeah. 2005. Right. Uh, sadly. And I didn't plan for it to get this much more relevant, right? <laughs> um, and it's, I wish it wasn't, right? We all right. wish it wasn't. We right. wish it was just a great story about two enemies who came together, but that's not what it is in today's context. Yeah. Now, what I will say is, making the film as the hate rhetoric and white nationalism and violence has increased over the last three, four years, I got, became more cognizant of the fact that I needed to be careful I needed to make sure I was telling the right story. And I ended up knowing that I did because a lot of people weighed in. Ann weighed in, Bill weighed in, Taraji. And, um, you know, it, it just it felt right. Um, but I definitely had more of a, uh, I definitely had, had more um, uh, of an eye toward making sure tone was right and all those things because it's now it's such a fragile time. You know, it's interesting right? because there's a way in which to tell the story you do want to acknowledge how Ellis gets humanized. Yeah. But you don't want to humanize Ellis too much to the point that you actually fictionalize who he was Correct. before that point in time. Right. 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 That's right. And, and again, when you tell a story you decide how far to go back in time. Right. right? right. Um, to me, he's the president of a, uh, you know, a violent hate group, right. the KKK, that's, you know, so I start there. I do, I, and, and again, um, I think that for me early on it was, where does this hate come from? I, you know, I'm not a, I, I didn't grow up a poor white southerner. Right. I certainly won't presume to know what it's like to be black in America. So um, I just wanted to find out how, where the hatred came from and how and why Anne decided to go through and try to break through him. Um, and so what I needed to do is dimensionalize him at least. I make, need to make him a three-dimensional person because whether you're a good person or you're a bad person or you're an agent of evil or everybody's still a three-dimensional person. Right, right. So for me, that's all I wanted. I just wanted to show, yes, he has a family, yes, he has a job, those things. And, and that's what Anne talked about to me. You know, she just at least once they started sitting down and they hate each other for so long, <laughs> She at least saw him as a human being, yeah. and then she could find her way in. They both grew up poor, right? Yeah. So, they, so, so they could find those common, that common ground somewhere. Absolutely. Right? It's just that it's interesting that the, the African-American groups that were poor and grew up that way weren't, you know, blaming the wrong people. Right. You know, <laughs> the, the, the poor white groups who were joining clans and other hate groups were, were blaming the, the wrong, wrong people, people. Right. instead of the white power structure, the rich, you know. Um, they should have been on the same side. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. Talk about, you know, being able to attract two Academy Award nominee actors to this, you know, project. Um, for two of this, I guess, you know, Rockwell, you know, just out of the nomination for Vice playing W. Right. Um, Taraji, you know, particularly as Cookie Lines, right, right. is this larger than life character, yeah. right, you know, yeah. outside of her career. That's right. Um, and even her nomination for Benjamin Bottoms. Talk about yeah. how it was to bring them to the project and what it was like working with them on the project. Yeah, well, so, you know, it, it, again, timing is everything. And so um, my good friend Danny Strong, who's a producer on this film, um, had just created Empire. And they were shooting the pilot, and I didn't know anything about the show. And I knew Taraji was in it, and he said, how about I give this to Taraji? I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> and so it was that quick. Um, and then Empire became a huge hit, right? And so we really started getting momentum. Um, and Taraji's schedule is such that she only has a few months in between Empire right, right, to be each year. Right. So we were trying to get it done that first year, couldn't. So we had to wait a whole year. And in that time... Um, Sam came to the project, okay. and again, bef we had shot, I mean, I've always loved Sam, he was at the top of my list, yeah. I knew he'd create a real character, I just wanted real, and Taraji, of course, loved Sam, she knows Sam's uh, girlfriend, uh, Leslie Bibb, um, well, and so, <coughs> it, just to have, as a first time director, just to have the, the two artists of this caliber, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, it just gives you more confidence, <laughs> it, you know you can't screw up too much, you know what I mean? And then after we shot, he, Sam goes and wins an Oscar, 
for three billboards, and yeah. then he gets nominated again. So this timing has been incredible for just the film and the and the yeah. artist in the film. I, I mean, and you know, normally I would I I was you know teetering on being intimidated by their talent, you know, and being a first time director before we started shooting, but right away it became very collaborative and they're so giving as actors, they made me feel completely comfortable, so. How familiar were they with the story of The Best Enemies? Um, Taraji, neither of them had heard the story, um, but as soon as Taraji started doing research and she has, she has a lot of ties in the South and went to 18, to eight, North Carolina A&T, I think, yeah. in Greensboro, um, her, she talked to her mother about it. Her mother said, oh, I know who Ann Atwater is. Like, right away. Everybody down here knows who she is. So then Taraji really got into doing research, but neither of them had heard it. Of course, now, you know, I mean, they're all over it. So. You were here last night, um, you know, for opening here in Durham. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like to present the film to the Durham community, and particularly the Durham black community, and what was their response to the film? Uh, this response was overwhelming. I was just so elated that people loved it. And I, I knew we had a good movie, but um, I, it took so long to do. And people were very patient, especially Anne. Well, Anne passed away, but her family, Bill Riddick and uh, Howard Clement, who's a big kind of icon in this community, yeah. too, who passed away. I got to meet him once before he died, and CP's family. Right. So just the having the families finally see it after all this time, after I first met them all in 2013, yeah. was great for me. Um, and to share it with the community and the black community, I, I just wanted to, I just hoped that I had told it in a way that was, that gave us hope and that people could be proud of Durham yeah. for. Yeah. Um, and walking in, it was funny, it wasn't funny actually, when I first pulled up last night, um, Marilyn Turner got out of her car, Ann's daughter Marilyn, yeah. who had flown up from St. Louis. And uh, as we were walking up, um, she said, it's interesting you've had this, at, you're having this at the Carolina Theater. And I said, well, it wasn't my decision, but Jonathan Wilson Hardgrove, right. they, they, yeah. and I said, great. And she said, because when I was a girl, they wouldn't let me in here to see the movie. That's, that's and I, I got story. chills when yeah. she said that. And I said, well, look at us now. You know, we're here to tell your mom's story. story so, right. Yeah. Uh, what do you hope the film does? Um, I know the book, for instance, here at Duke, um, it's been a, a first year reading summer book, you right. know. Um, I could imagine there are lots of uh, K through 12 schools that will find some value, I right, so. in the film at this point in time. But what kind of work do you actually think it hopes, you know, what kind of it does, you know, for the way that we think about race at this point in time? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's hard to say, you know, when I look at Anne and I say, well, she didn't have to go, she didn't have to work on this guy. Right? She didn't have to. It's not her job to make sure he starts seeing the world the right Definitely. way. Right. Yeah. But she did. And she did it for kids. She did it for the school. She did it for the community. I understand why she did it. And then they became friends. So I'm not really, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily a proponent of going out and finding neo-Nazis and sitting down <laughs> with them. You know what I mean? Because, you know, it's not everyone's I, I job you. to do I that. However, I um, there's a lot of people with hatred in their heart that is misguided, it's been taught. Misinformed, it's, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so at least uh, it may give us hope that some hearts can be changed somewhere along the line. They have to do their part, clearly. But um, I think that if this can happen in the South in 1971 between these two specific people who couldn't have been more diametrically opposed, then maybe, maybe you know, we all get so, we're so anxiety ridden about yeah. God, it's so bad out there. How are we ever going to change it? And, and you know, it's they're big mountains, but but maybe you start taking the first steps. You know? yeah. yeah. This obviously was a labor of love for you, uh, particularly you know doing the adaptation and directing it yourself. Um, what's on the docket next for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so it's been I've been waiting for this to come out. It always helps when you have a movie actually in the theaters. So uh, I've been writing an original, which is more of a thriller, kind of interesting thriller that I've been wanting to do for a while, and I'm in the middle of that right now. And I have a couple other projects. There's a book, a World War II book, um, that I'm uh, planning a uh, like a limited series, like an eight-part series, yeah. maybe on a Netflix or something, yeah. Yeah. about a woman named Andre de Young, who was a young Belgian woman in World War II, who established something called, she was like 23, she established something called the Comet Line, which would take... Uh, 
British RAF soldiers who had been left behind after Dunkirk or were POWs, they're hidden in Belgium. She'd take them all the way through occupied France into Spain, into the British consulate, and they saved like 800 people. Mm. And she had eventually got caught and put in Ravensburg concentration camp in Germany, the all women's concentration yeah. camp, and lived through the war. And eventually got the Medal of Freedom. I mean, an amazing woman, you know. And instead of like taking that, and she was only 28 at the time when she got the Medal of Freedom and the George Freedom, and instead of taking that, uh, you know, celebrity and dining out on it the rest of her life, she just decided to go into the Congo and help lepers. <laughs> I mean, this is that this yeah. is a woman, you know. So it's cool. Yeah. And I haven't sold it yet, but we own a book with a I have another producer in Britain who has the book, so I'm hoping to yeah. do something with that. We've been joined today by Robin Bissell, who is the director and also the screenwriter, adapted screenwriter of the new film, That's the Enemies, based on uh, the relationship between uh, Ann Atwater and C.P. Ellis. Thank you for joining us, Robin. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything. Everything black. Culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back. Black.